So I'll start with sequencing and I'll finish with immunotherapy because of course um, we have a lot of data on sequencing now. I think we can very nicely answer this question. Uh, with, there's still a lot of uh, new developments in the immunotherapy f uh, uh, field that uh, we still have hard time figuring out how we're gonna get this into the uh, way we treat the relapse today, at least in Europe. Um, maybe this is already very much implemented in the US, but uh, it's still, still very primary in Europe. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Kami for this kind of invitation, indeed, the chairs, and particularly uh, Mohamed Moti, he has been nice enough to share some of his slides, and I appreciate that. Um, these are monorium uh, and disclosures. Um, so we, I guess, I guess in myeloma, in the past, uh, I would say, five, seven years, we have made in the relapse setting a tremendous uh, progress in, uh, based on many, many uh, phase three clinical trials that were run for registration for companies to register drugs, but definitely because of the number of patients helped us understand uh, uh, how we should treat these patients and how we could improve. And I also want to, to thank Meral, uh, Dr. Bexash, that are very nicely paved the path of my talk uh, with um, an outline of all these uh, clinical studies that have been run. So in the relapse setting, you have two big groups today, and I would almost say three, but at least you have two groups of patients that you see in your practice. A group number one, what we call the early relapse patient at first relapse, second line, uh, or patient third line, second relapse. This patient, I will show you in a minute that we still uh, can definitely make great progress in the way we treat these patients, and I'll show to you improved overall survival, and clearly for this patient, you are definitely not in the palliative care field era, uh, which is gonna be, of course, completely different with the late relapse beyond uh, uh, third line, fourth and beyond. Uh, it's quite interesting in clinical trials to see that sometimes patients that had 15 lines, particularly in the US, uh, and it's a lot of fun because you always wonder how can you give 15 lines to a patient with myeloma, uh, but we definitely today can give five, six, seven lines. It's impressive how we are creative in the uh, palliative care, but honestly, when you start being fourth line and beyond, you are in the palliative care in myeloma. Um, on top of the, of the various uh, guidelines that have been alluded to and presented by uh, Dr. Mbeksash, I'd like to highlight for you the ESMO guidelines. Of course, it was signed by Philippe Moreau, a, a French colleague, but, uh, but, I, but I think it's another and a different guideline that shows pretty much the same thing and, and actually highlight very nicely uh, what uh, Dr. Bexash has presented to you, which is that you are going to have to decide how you treat patients in the relapse setting based on what the patient got initially. And what Philippe uh, very nicely introduced here was that if you got a PI-based regimen initially, you're likely gonna start a Revlimid linalidomide-based regimen in the relapse setting and vice versa. If you had a linalidomide-based regimen initially, you would probably favor a proteasome inhibitor. Later on, it becomes more complex, but we'll discuss this briefly. So the situation we, are, we have, most of us, I guess, Europeans or, or, or European-affiliated countries, um, I guess we use massively protezom inhibitors up front, uh, and particularly botezomib. At least that is the situation in France. Uh, uh, there is no uh, yet access to ixazomib, and there is not yet access to cofilzomib up front in, uh, in myeloma field in, 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 in Europe. So our primary backbone use drug in the relapse setting, in the early relapse setting, naturally, is linalidomide. And I have to say that out of all the studies that have been presented in clinical trials, IITs, so academic sponsored, or even retrospective studies, I suspect two combinations are really showing up very, very nicely, which is either uh, imid pi dexamethasone, lenalidomide, a proteasome inhibitor, and dexamethasone, or, and I'll show to you some data in a, in a minute, lenalidomide dexamethasone plus a monoclonal antibody, and we would agree on that the anti-CD38 is a clear-cut revolution to myeloma. Now, at the end of the day, whatever combination you use, you will see that across my talk, uh, three take-home messages will, will pop up, and it's very easy, we have, we have clear-cut data now, hundreds of patients treated the same way. You have to use ideally a triplet if you can, and we start thinking about quadruplets, but 
Yes, we have data on triplet. Uh, high risk have improved. I would not necessarily uh, uh, back up Meral on this one. I still believe the high risk are very, very poor risk, and we still struggle very much for the high risk compared to the standard risk. And I, and I, and I think as much as we have improved the high risk, there's still an enormous difference between high risk and standard risk. And, and it's quite interesting to see that MOD is becoming an interesting endpoint for, for, for relapse refractory setting as it was, and as we know it is for the upfront setting. I'll pass this briefly, first of all, because it's a table, it's quite busy, also because Meral, in certain extent, Dr. Beksash, in certain extent, have, has shown this. I just want to say that on top of Pollux and Asperger, two studies that I will repeatedly talk about in my talk, I will not talk too much about Eloquent 2 and Tumalin, but, um, but there are, there are four main studies that have been looked, looking into uh, demonstrating uh, how we can uh, best treat patients in a relapse setting. I guess, I guess we have to show, at least today, Pollux as number one study because it is, uh, I, I would say, one of the greatest data we've seen in myeloma so far. It's totally groundbreaking. It, uh, it probably is gonna blow up the use of transplant in the relapse setting. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we have yet to see what, was, what will be the exact uh, median uh, progression-free survival of that study called Pollux, which was um, randomization, head-to-head, uh, -head, phase three, of daratumumab, first-in-class anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, to uh, a revlimid dexamethasone. So it's a triplet to a doublet. But what you have to know beyond this, and you'll see, I'll come back to this, that so you have a comparison of a triplet versus a doublet, this is essentially patient in first relapse. Most of these patients have never had Revlimid before. Actually, only 15% of the patients were in retreatment with Revlimid. And the treatment was in the two arms given until progression never stopped. So we could have a discussion later on on the cost of this, etc. and I'm sure Professor Jean-Luc Arousseau, if he's in the room, will certainly tackle me, as he has done a week ago in Turin, uh, about the fact that it's nice to show great data, but you have to anticipate how much we're gonna pay for that and if it's uh, cost feasible. But here, I'm talking about science, evidence-based medicine on how we should treat best myeloma. Then if you want, we could discuss um, how we can uh, manage this fin financially. But here, scientifically, Pollux tells you that if you go triplet, if you go early on first relapse, if you use a switch of the backbone and, and an add-on drug that has never been tested, uh, exposed for the patients, then your median PFS will be absolutely uh, groundbreaking and we are anticipating more than 40 months, more than 40 months without transplant, just a triplet-based regimen. Now, it's not just about prolonging progression for survival in myeloma in the relapse setting, we've heard um, great news from another study called ASPIRE. This time, it's not daratumumab, ravlimid dexamethasone, it is cofilzomib, kyprolis, compared to revdex. It's kind of a similar design, phase three, early relapse, patients never exposed to cafilzomib, some of the patients exposed to Revlimid, but very few. Uh, and at the end of the day, a triplet versus a doublet, you can see again, early separation of the curves. And there's just one thing you need to know, because the design of the curve is not exactly, the shape of the curve is not exactly the same as with, uh, with uh, Pollux, which is that at 18 months, Cofilzomib was stopped because I guess the company years ago anticipated it was difficult to maintain Cofilzomib, the triplet-based combination, until progression. And you can see that potentially the, the benefit of the triplet-based combination was not as, as great as it could have been. But at the end of the day, uh, last year, the company was able to show that based on Aspire, there was an overall survival benefit of starting triplet, starting early, trying to maintain your triplet as much as possible, as much as here, it will stop at 18 months. And, and, and this paves the path for what we should do in myeloma in the early relapse setting. Uh, now, if we try to make comparison, which I not truly uh, think we should do head to head, but at the end of the day, uh, we can see that uh, there is here with Pollux, a median PFS that is going to reach potentially 40 months. We know with Aspire, that the median PFS for the whole study was 26 months, much less, I would say. In the, in the first relapse 
only the first relapse, it was 29 months, so close to 30 months, still, still 10 months, maybe a year short with, compared to Pollux. Maybe one explanation to that was that carfilzomib was stopped at 18 months. We would never know, but potentially that tells you that if you want to start triplet, if you can, if you can pay for a, a triplet-based combination, then you should go until progression and not stop your triplet-based combination short uh, because you may lose part of the benefit you've had. As much as this is not something we can definitely scientifically confirm because we have no comparison, uh, I stop versus I continue, and this is back to uh, the studies that Professor Moti will run on behalf of the IFM, uh, which is, uh, uh, can, we, can we give two years or a limited number of treatment triplet versus a continuous, and how much we make a difference. From Pollux last year at ASH, we've learned something very interesting that uh, we could uh, look into minimal cell disease, 10 to minus 4, 5 or 6, who I'm not going to discuss the cutoff here, uh, in the relapse setting. That, was, that is the first study ever to demonstrate this endpoint could be of interest in, in myeloma in the relapse setting. Of course, I'm not saying you should stop treatment because you had an MOD negative, etc. We have no clue. Um, but what we can see, and it's actually of great interest, is that you, you keep improving your MOD potential reach of MOD negativity uh, until approximately two years. And at two years, still some patient could improve, but the bulk of the patient has already reached best response, best depth of response. So MOD is key. MOD takes time, and you have to consider this in the way you treat the patients. Another key element of what we know now of the MOD in the relapse setting, but it is actually, to my, to my knowledge, very similar to what we know up front, is that it's actually very interesting to see that the patient which are MOD negative, it's, it doesn't matter how they were treated. So they are the sort of lucky patient, if I could say, probably not too lucky having myeloma, but lucky in a way that they, that they are very ultra good risk, ultra standard risk, that could reach MOD even with a tablet-based regimen. Very few, but still some patients on a tablet-based regimen could be MOD negative, and you can see how the, the benefit is absolutely, absolutely gigantic. If you are MOD positive, then you better be on a triplet-based combination. And knowing that you cannot anticipate the MOD before you start the treatment, that tells you that you're better off starting your patients on a triplet-based combination. Now, what about high risk? I started my talk saying that I personally struggled very much with the high risk. It's a high risk to me is, is a desperate situation systematically, not just by cytogenetic, but also by plasma cell leukemia presentation, plasma blastic features, extramdary disease, and potentially even being MOD positive is going to be considered soon as a high risk feature and it's likely going to be when we see the difference within the survival of the patients. But you can see here with Aspire, Tumalin or Pollux that if you were high risk, when you, when you were stand, sorry, when you were standard risk, you benefited maximally from the treatment, but when you were high risk, it was always limited to maximum two years. So in high risk myeloma, we hardly make a PFS median better than two years. While in Pollux, we're gonna be 40 years for the, for the whole bulk of patients, and likely this is gonna be essentially for the high risk, for the standard risk. Um, there's another way of defining high risk uh, uh, and, uh, and non-high risk patients, uh, which I like very much because this is what we see in the, in the real practice, which is some patients will relapse early from the upfront treatment and some patients will relapse late. That doesn't mean that when they relapse late, not necessarily you had had a clonal evolution or appearance of a very nasty presentation of myeloma, but still, the patient who relapse late, you are more likely uh, to consider these patients are of good risk. And if you compare the benefit of triplet doublet according to early versus late relapse, so here you are not into cytogenetic, etc. You just look at the benefit initially you had from the first line, you can see that there is a big difference, which tells you that any so tiny type of definition of high risk, in my view, um, still, the, these patients with high risk features don't benefit from all these improvements. Still, you have to give the treatment this way to these patients, but we have to do something better for those patients. Uh, for the high-risk patients, so what we can do, so there is some preliminary data from Pollux 
It's a sub-analysis. It's very preliminary. There will certainly be updates at ASCO EHA and ASH this year. But what, what we've seen was that if you are high-risk myeloma in Pollux, there are, there are RevDEX versus RevDEX. And if you were MAD negative, at least at 27, 24, 33 months, so almost three years, the, the MAD negative, a great benefit from this triplet-based combination treatment anti-progression. However, if you were MAD positive, being doublet to triplet and high risk, then you completely lose the benefit of the triplet combination, which really, again, uh, uh, I think, tells me that at the end of the day, uh, for the high risk, we're going to have to reinvent the treatment of myeloma. Still, you give a triplet, you give a triplet until progression, and you fight for it, but at the end of the day, you will lose the game unless you are MAD negative. If you are MAD positive, you're going to have to redefine myeloma. Potentially, we could ask um, Professor Nagler if he would transplant this patient and reuse, resume the treatment to push this patient maximally to MAD negative, and, uh, and uh, we'll see to that. Now, most of us in Europe would say, well, we are poor countries. Uh, even Germany doesn't want to pay for the rest of Europe anymore. And uh, Qatar and all the Middle East countries only pay for sport, not for healthcare, which is a very sad situation. So, um, well, what about doublet regimen? Are all the patients bound to take a triplet-based regimen and potentially tomorrow quadruplet? Well, to be very honest, I think all the patients are bound to take a triplet-based regimen. But certainly some patients, could do very well on the tablet-based regimens. This, this is a sub-analysis based on depth of response that I'm showing to you from the first IFM 2701, which is not a relapse study. It's an upfront study. But I guess it's the same in the relapse. Yes, we could see some patients, for example, on Revlimid dexamethasone in the first IFM 2701, again, non-transplant eligible upfront study. I want to I want to remind to you that those patients who got a complete response and got Revlimid until progression performed very nicely, median PFS 60 months approx, five years, and for the VGPR 49 months, uh, uh, approximately four, five years as well. So I still think that in the relapse setting, you could use a tablet-based regimen, for example, based on lenalidomide dexamethasone, but it's risky because you never know how much this patient could have done better on a triplet-based regimen if you were able to manage it. Now, because Revlimid is now approved up front in most of the country in the world, either as maintenance, post-transplant, or botizomib, Revdex, and maintenance in the context of transplant, and because it is also approved ma uh, massively in the world, um, uh, in non-transplant eligible patients as Revdex or even in the US, botizumib Revdex based on the SWOG study. I hope you understand it all, but you should have, you should. Uh, we're gonna have patients exposed to Revlimid up front, not necessarily exposed to proteasome inhibitors. And then for these patients, if you look at the recommendations, then you will expose these patients primarily to proteasome inhibitors in the relapse setting. They have been exposed to lenalidomide up front. And so the question is, what do we know about proteasome inhibitors dex backbone in the relapse setting? And Dr. Bexash alluded to that, but at the end of the day, you are pretty much down to the same combination, PI imidex or PI anti CD38. The thing here is that uh, we have very few data because this is not a situation we've uh, had in the past years. And most of the myeloma, most of these patients recruited in all these studies, uh, Castor, Endeavor, uh, uh, Panorama, and, uh, and, and one of the eloquent study, all of these patients have had Velcade before. So this is massively a retreatment of backbone, and you will see that the data are not as good. So you can see here that Daratumumab Velcade, Botezomib dexamethasone, most of these patients were in second relapse, third line. 65% have had before Velcade, Compared to Pollux, only 15% have had before Ravlimid. Here, 65% of the patients have had Velcade before, have seen Velcade before, not refractory, still exposed. And you can see that the benefit of the triplet daratumumab combination is 16.7 months. It's extremely low if you compare to Pollux about 40 months. It's even low if you compare to Revlimid dexamethasone doublet, 18 months. 
So even a Dablet Revdex or a Dablet Cough Filzomib Dexamethasone Endeavor making 18 months median PFS is better than this. That doesn't mean that Daratumumab is not great combined to a protezome inhibitors at all. This is not my point. It just means that if you give the best drug late, if you retreat your patient with the same backbone, and here, if you stop Velcade at some point and go only until progression with Daratumumab single agent, you're losing the take home message that we have discussed initially, triplet, at best until progression, starting as early as possible. And now, you can look at the high risk, you will find the same, the same uh, sort of uh, picture that we have seen before, the MAD negative perform nicely, all the other patients perform much less, uh, much poorly, much, much, in, in a much worse situation, but in Castor, it's even worse than in Pollux. Now, one thing that we have learned from Endeavor, so I'm switching from Castor to Endeavor now, which is carfilzomib dexamethasone head-to-head comparison to botezomib dexamethasone. One thing that we have learned very, very nicely, and it was a great surprise, was that if you give Velcade initially upfront and carfilzomib at first relapse, you will very nicely uh, have the patient see the patients benefiting from it. You can see that the, here the median survival of, of botezomib, the median survival of carfilzomib, and uh, it's PFS. And you can see that you double up nine months PFS median, 18 months me, me, uh, median PFS, which tells you that when you give botezomib initially, if you want to switch, not to reuse botezomib, then you can use carfilzomib. It's a perfect switch. As you are used to do in, with imids, talidomide, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, or lenalidomide, pomalidomide. It's a complete switch, same family, complete different drugs. So going from botezomib up front, you can give carfilzomib in the relapse and you take the best benefit of these PI combinations. Plus, last year at ASH, we've heard that with Endeavor, as for Aspire, there is a benefit in survival, in overall survival, not just a benefit in PFS. So this concept of if you give botezomib initially, you can go carfilzomib in the relapse, perfect switch, or if you give Revlimid initially, you can go pomalidomide, perfect switch. This concept of switch, change drugs, even in the same family, as long as you switch, is actually validated in myeloma in the relapse setting. Now, someone in the room, of course, is going to raise his hand and say, I had a patient, he was VAD tandem transplant in 1992, never relapsed. What can I give these patients? Well, by definition, anything. Um, or someone in the, in, the, in the room who raised hand and say, I had a patient in 2002. He got botezomib thaldex initially, and he wants botezomib back. Am I not going to give botezomib to that patient? Well, you could. And I could show you some data saying that for patients who benefited maximally from the treatment initially, you could retreat. But it's always, it's always tricky. If you look at, for example, Tumelin, patient who had prior length, but this is not a good example. Well, whatever. I don't have the slide with the good example. But what I wanted to say, <laughs> it's not the good, the good slide, but what I wanted to say that if you look at Prior LEN, for example, for studies who have compared lenalidomide dexamethasone triplet to lenalidomide dexamethasone doublet in the relapse setting, you will see that they benefit, but always a little bit less. The problem is that you cannot identify the patient, that you can retreat, they will get the same benefit compared to patients that you will retreat and they will not get the same benefit. So I think it's better to switch. And this is actually true for the transplant, that uh, uh, the Professor Nagler very nicely told us that even with high-dose chemo, which is really like an enormous treatment, the benefit in the relapse is never exactly the same as initially, correct? So if I try to wrap up my relapse talk, uh, pretty much uh, I would like to make a comparison which is, uh, again, an unfair comparison. Uh, I want to compare Pollux to Castor. I don't want to you to remember that Dara Revdex is gigantic and Dara VD is no good. This is absolutely not my point. My point is there are still differences if we want to compare these two uh, triplet versus doublet combination in the relapse setting. This is essentially first relapse, second relapse, second line, third line. Triplet until progression, triplet stop single agent until progression. 
Here, 15% only of the patients have had Revlimid before, 65 had had Bortezomib before. And so at the end of the day, you can very nicely understand that you should triplet as early as possible, switch as much as possible the backbone and the combinatory drugs, and you'll do great. But not your high-risk patients will maximize at about two years. What is the future? Again, I'll be quick because uh, Dr. Bexash has, uh, has uh, alluded to this. Uh, there is a study that was run for the US um, to allow pomalidomide to be finally approved in the US based on the phase three data because it was fast tracked before and, uh, and the FDA has granted approval, final approval uh, to pomalidomide without any data from phase three. Lucky are the US people. And at the end of the day, still Celgene ran that study and it was called Optimism MM007, PVD, and uh, Meral has very nicely introduced PVD versus VD. The interest for us Europeans on this study is major because that study included recruited patients in first relapse. But in Europe, we can only use pomalidomide in third line, second relapse. So potentially, if there are sufficient number of patients at first relapse here, and PVD is better than VD, likely Celgin will be able to approve pomalidomide first relapse and not third line. And so we will have an early access to pomalidomide, which is obviously a great need. What's coming in in the field? Uh, precision medicine is very much not for myeloma, I would say, uh, but there are some attempts. And two I want to mention, uh, Venetoclax and Selinexor. I don't know if uh, the Professor Anderson will validate Selinexo as precision medicine, but I guess in certain extent it is, though it's probably not too much precision, but it is in a certain extent. But venetoclax is definitely considered as precision medicines, special to inhibitor, and uh, there are ample data. I'll pass this very rapidly because um, because we'll certainly hear about this, and there is an immunotherapy talk right after. But overall, what I want to point out is that. Uh, there is some studies looking at venetoclax, BCL2 inhibitors, and there will be studies coming soon with an MCL1 inhibitor to look into specific apoptotic treatments, anti-apoptotic treatment, uh, pro-apoptotic treatments, I would say, uh, uh, to allow uh, the patients, some of the patients, to benefit from simple treatment, and venetoclax is one of them. So I'll move on with immunotherapy. Um, because that was the second talk. So you know that there are three major families of immunotherapy. Basic, I would say, or passive or naive immunotherapy. That is the one you know of. And of course, the new active, CAR-Ts, bite bikes, vaccines, conjugated. The, the people who make immunotherapy are even more creative than us. Now, it's actually very interesting because we all have the feeling that we have discovered immunotherapy with Elotuzumab, first in class SLAM F7, CS1 antibody, and Daratumumab, first in class, only CD38. But, and I picked this slide from Professor Moti, but shame on me because, so he's old enough to know that there has been plenty of attempts of immunotherapy in myeloma, and all of them pretty much failed. I'm actually old enough as well to have known some of them, anti-EGF1 or EGF1 receptor, anti-IL-6 or IL-6 receptor, even anti-CD138. I participated when I was a baby, a hematologist. I participated to these studies, and all of them failed. So it's actually, it's actually quite interesting to know that uh, daratumumab, anti-CD38, and potentially elotuzumab, why are these antibodies working? If everything we have tested before failed. I think daratumumab is one of the key, most interesting aspect of it because it is definitely, the, so far, the most effective monoclonal antibody we have. And, um, and I took the slides from, from Mohammed, and I thank you, uh, Mohammed, for that. Uh, in blood, it was, it was demonstrated that there is here a potential complete novel mechanism of action of immunotherapy in myeloma, which would be a sort of uh, immunomodulator drug where um, uh, certain subpopulation of T cells express ED38, and particularly these cells who make a break put a break on the, on the recognition, immune restoration, immune surveillance of the patients. And potentially by destroying the, CD, the CD38 plus T regs, you would activate some CD8, uh, and this would expand and uh, potentially be one of the most 
interesting, maybe one convincing mechanification of Daratumumab map to explain why Daratumumab map is so active compared to all the monoclonal antibodies we have tested before. Now, trying to cover uh, immunotherapy and especially daratumumab is quite difficult because I guess there is no aspect of myeloma where, where the company has not been doing uh, studies, maybe not in MGUS, not in pumps, uh, but that's pretty much it. Uh, anything else has been covered by the company. So very in brief, Centaurus is, um, is a study for smoldering multiple myeloma, but we'll get uh, to this in the debate I'll have with uh, Pro Professor Mateos in a minute. Just to say that this study is ongoing, this study will certainly show that there is a benefit of daratumumab, single agent in, uh, in smoldering myeloma, to delay the development of full bloom myeloma, and you have to give him at the regular dose and the regular scheme. And I'll pass this. This Centaurus will be followed, is actually followed by a phase three study called Aquila. Aquila is daratumumab single agent versus watch and wait, which is a way we treat smoldering myeloma today, and I guess most of us are participating to Aquila. Um, another era of, uh, of myeloma, upfront for non-transplant elderly myeloma, Alcyon, presented by Marivy Mateos, late breaking abstract last year, published now. Uh, and uh, in New England Medicine, Alcyon was Velcade malfanon prednisone compared to the same backbone, but plus daratumumab. One may regret uh, the maintenance daratumumab here because you have a benefit of a quadruplet here plus a maintenance here. Here, only a triplet and no maintenance. But what Marivy very nicely showed is that by giving daratumumab on top of the same backbone VMP, you can immediately put the patients on a complete different path. This is autoroute and this is what you can do. Uh, as, as much as this VMP is not extremely good, because it's only 18 months, it could be better, uh, still the, the benefit of the daratumumab addition and the continuous daratumumab is pretty clear in Alcyon and that paves the path for future use of daratumumab in non-transplant eligible myeloma upfront in the future. Again, MOD negative, same story as we have discussed before. If you are MOD negative, it doesn't matter what kind of treatment you've got, but if you are MOD positive, you better be having the most optimized uh, treatment combination. Now, this was, Alcyon was non-transplant. Now, transplant. Transplant eligible, two combinations. One combination with bortezomib brevdex, daratumumab, it's ongoing, it's called griffin, whatever. And of course, Philippe Moreau touched upon, and, and Hervé Aveloiseau touched upon that study, Cassiope, which is a consortium IFM and the Dutch, Netherlands. And uh, this is VTD based. So VTD versus VTD daratumumab. And we have a second randomization, watch and wait, no maintenance versus daratumumab. And in the middle, we have a transplant. So Griffin, VRD, Dara, and Cassiope, VTD, Dara, are transplant studies. Sorry. Of course, I'm not showing any data. You'll have to wait a little bit. Now, in the relapse setting, daratumumab, of course, is everywhere, as I've said. Um, I will not come back to Pollux, and I will not come back to Castor. But I wanted to say that the, the, the issue of Castor, daravidi, with a V not, very, not being very, very effective, is kind of a, is kind of a, a little bit um, uh, washed out with this carfilzomib combination. MMY1001 was a demonstration that you could replace Velcade by carfilzomib, and then you have a switch. So very briefly, we've, we've seen that, uh, that the patients were doing great, that the safety was okay, and that you could get MOD. This, study, and I'll pass this to be in time. This study, Carfilzomib Revdex, um, has been the initiation of Condor. Condor is a phase three study, Carfilzomib Daradex versus Daradex, uh, versus Carfilzomib Dex, sorry. And Condor is close to, re to recruitment, and we wait for the results. Now you can also combine Daratumumab to Pomalidomide, and this, uh, has uh, that's been published by uh, Ajay Shari in Blood. Uh, I'm not going back to this because because we wait for the phase three. The phase three is called Icaria. It's close to recruitment. We no not Icaria because Apollo. It's ongoing for recruitment. And if you are interesting, you have to contact EMN. Uh, 
the European myeloma network. But what you can see in this advanced DARA pomalidomide dexamethasone study <laughs> is that despite the great combination, you still have some patients who will do very poorly, but you also have some patients that responded that will probably have a very prolonged survival in third and fourth line, so very advanced myeloma patients. Now, I think one of the greatest data we've heard at ASH was PAVO. Why PAVO? PAVO is a demonstration that you could use daratumumab sub-Q on a three to five minute push at a fixed dose. And uh, you can see how, again, it's kind of uh, 20 years later, the Velcade story, when they moved to, maybe not 20 years, maybe 10, when they moved from IV to sub-Q, and you can see how the IV peak and then, and then sort of go down in terms of serum concentration versus the sub-Q, slow increase, but maintained, and the results are here to demonstrate that sub-Q has future for the RTMMAD because the results are as good as for the IV. Now, of course, uh, there has, there's another antibody, we all have great ex uh, hope with daratumumab, but there is also elotuzumab, and uh, at ASH there was an update of eloquan 2 elotuzumab Lendex versus Lendex. I'll pass this briefly to say that uh, there is a, a clear-cut benefit from the elotuzumab combination, even though, of course, it's not, maybe not as, in, as great as is for daratumumab, but still, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Overall survival and PFS. There is a new anti-CD38, you know daratumumab, but you're gonna have to rehearse a bit and uh, try to learn isatuximab, which is a new anti-CD38 from a different company, and um, our colleagues in the US have started a bunch of isatuximab combinations, um, and we have, uh, we have uh, as well worked with uh, Joe Michael in an isatuximab post-daratumumab. Isatuximab has three major phase three ongoing, Icaria that I mentioned earlier, plus Pomdex, it's close to recruitment, don't even try. But Ikema, Isatuximab carfilzomib dexamethasone versus carfilzomib dexamethasone is recruiting. And Imroz, it's, it's kind of, I don't know who's finding all these names of, of studies, but uh, these guys deserve to have great salaries. Um, um, because it's kind of a work. And maybe we should have great salaries because we try to learn and remember all these names. So Imroz is botezomib refdex versus botezomib refdex Isatuximab up front and it's open to recruitment in Europe. Um, you will see that most, if not all, of the European, and I apologize, I'm not gonna show any US study here, but in Europe, we have immediately implemented the monoclonal antibodies into the treatment of our patients. This is a German study up front, when you can see the addition of elotuzumab everywhere in the study. This is an IFM sort of, um, template of the next study where you can see systematically there is an anti-CD38 before, after, etc. This is from UK. Even in UK, they have planned to use monoclonal antibodies in their studies everywhere, particularly in standard risk, but also in high risk. And uh, the, the PETIMA, the, the, the Spanish, have also uh, planned to add um, a monoclonal antibody in their treatments in elderly patients fit. And we in the IFM are going to run at some point this REVDEX compared to REVDARATUMUMAB. So you can see that it's kind of obvious that the monoclonal antibodies are now absolutely key in myeloma, are going to be part of all our treatments. But that was a naive three more slides, I promise, and I'm done for the sake of time. Of course, we are not gonna cure myeloma. I mean, maybe we could discuss this, uh, and maybe some of you would disagree with this, but I do not see any cure in my practice. I see 100 myeloma a week, and there is no cure. And all of them die, and all of them will die of myeloma. The high risk before, but they all die. So we need something new. Um, and so, of course, we are very excited with all the generation, all these new developments of uh, active immunotherapy, and I just want to mention the CAR-Ts because they've had lots of data at ASH last year. The first CAR-T was CD19, but I pass this. To talk about the BCMA, large experience from the US, and to talk about the Chinese presented at ASCO and ASH last year with a great hope 
you can see in that study that with the Chinese CAR T, not too many side effects. At least the side effect profile was very minimal, and uh, the efficacy was uh, very impressive. And uh, hopefully, in Europe, we're going to have uh, access to this uh, uh, technology, and uh, and it's coming. With this, I'll thank you very much, and maybe we have time for a couple of questions. Thank you.